Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 650. Why blood test of testosterone, and free testosterone alone, don't reveal how you will respond to hormones. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. This week I'm going to talk about, um, try to teach you about um, testosterone levels and, that's blood levels, and testosterone receptor sites, which sounds very complex, but I'll make it easy. And it is going to explain why each person cannot have the same dose of testosterone and expect to have the same outcome. So. Um, I'm, I'm known to use blood tests. When I ask for a new patient to come in, they do their blood tests before they even see me so that I can make sure that I can help them. If their blood tests are perfect and I lo- then look at their symptoms and their history of illnesses and their medications, and I put that together to determine whether testosterone or estrogen or both will be helpful for them. So when that is, that is um, decided, then we make an appointment for our patients. So we kind of skip that first visit, the visit where you go in to see the doctor and you tell them what's wrong, and then they say, take these, do these tests and come back in a month or two. So we try to skip that visit because that seems to be a waste of uh, my patient's money and my time. I can, I can do this if they fill out their forms properly and look, I can look at their blood work, but it is not just blood work. It is both what the patient tells me and what the patient writes down and all of their history that I can put together with their blood tests to tell what type of testosterone and how much they need and what will be effective for them. And then, even then, I don't have a solid test for saying this test will tell me how effective a certain dose of testosterone will be on you as an individual. Because interestingly enough, that's all genetically determined. And it's a test that we don't have yet as clinicians. We have it in research, but we don't have it as, in, as clinicians. So many of the ways I treat my patients have to do with what information I receive from them, their lifestyle, and their diet, their exercise. All of those things come into play when I'm deciding how much testosterone to give them, and what level I'm looking for. So um, knowing all of that about my practice, um, when I was in um, Cambridge in 2014, we had a a book opening in the UK. And um, we went to London, and then we went to Cambridge for uh, lectures that we gave on the book, The Secret Female Hormone, which was a hormone about testosterone for women and the first first, um, critical review of why women need testosterone. So while I was there, I went to the medical bookstore just to see what they had. And interestingly enough, I saw a book that I've never seen in the US and it was called Just Testosterone. It was a book about that thick, it weighed 10 pounds, and somehow I got it back to these states in my luggage because it was, it was pretty heavy. So I, I normally wouldn't buy anything that, to bring back that was 10 pounds. But it was very much worth it. Um, this very question of how can I determine exactly the proper dose based on blood levels for a patient How can I do that? Is there a trick to that? Is there something I don't know? That was a question in my mind in 2014 because at that time I didn't know much about receptor sites. Just think, if you have a a pitcher and a catcher at a baseball game, you have to have somebody throwing the ball to somebody who's catching it 
And both people have to be good or, or, or the ball won't be caught or it won't actually fool the batter. In any case, you have to have both things in place. Testosterone that is in your blood, the level of testosterone in your blood, all the effect that it has, all is determined by the receptor sites on your cells. So this book explained that so beautifully that you have to have enough testosterone to fill the receptor sites, and some receptor sites are resistant. They aren't going to join with the testosterone as easily as other receptor sites. And some people are born with very sensitive receptor sites, and some people are born with very resistant receptor sites. So you can throw the same ball at the mitt. Have you ever seen those mitts with Velcro on them? And they, you know, they sometimes they stick and sometimes they don't. So you could have a, a mitt like that, and sometimes in some people, testosterone is not going to stick. Even if you have a high level of it, of course, it, the level does help um, saturate these receptor sites, but some of the receptor sites are just not as sticky. So then you have a group of people who genetically have receptor sites that are very sticky, and they don't need that much testosterone. They Both the amount of testosterone that they have and their receptor sites were both programmed at birth. And they have they change a little with age. They change a little with uh, lifestyle. They change a lot with lifestyle. You can actually make some receptor sites in certain areas of your body more receptive if you uh, have a healthy lifestyle than others. Uh, there are some things that we do that are negative for our receptor sites, like drinking, alcohol, and um, too much alcohol, too little good food, too many carbs, that kind of thing. We can actually affect our receptor sites. But in the beginning, it was all predetermined by our genes. Now, the way they described it in this book and the way I'd like to describe it to you is that they were looking for people who were much more likely to have prostate cancers grow quickly versus prostate cancers growing slowly. So they determined that or they looked at the genetic receptor sites and the amount of testosterone. They used a, the same kind of testosterone, same dose, same, and they got the same blood level. But there were genetic differences. Some people did not have, their, their testosterone didn't make that prostate cancer grow fast. It w they didn't have sticky receptor sites. And then some people had very sticky receptor sites, and just a small amount of testosterone made their prostate cancers grow. Now, just to make cl this clear, testosterone doesn't cause prostate cancer, but once you have it, testosterone does speed along the growth of certain prostate cancers in certain people. So we're looking at the differences in the people who have a prostate cancer. And they found certain SNPs that, of the genes, certain little pieces of your DNA that made people more likely to have a fast uh, growth of a prostate cancer from testosterone. And then they found people who were more resistant, who would, who would need a lot more testosterone to actually make that prostate cancer grow. And they, then they likened it to, the, to similar things those receptor sites were either very sticky or weren't very sticky for other purposes. In other words, people who had sticky receptor sites didn't need as much testosterone to actually make them feel better all over. Because the receptor sites are everywhere. They're in all of your cells. So those folks, the bad news was if they got a prostate cancer, testosterone would make it grow fast. The good news was they didn't need as much testosterone if they were, if they had these very sticky receptor sites. And the opposite is true. Same with the people that were, they had very resistant receptor sites. So the good news is testosterone didn't make their cancer grow as fast, but they also needed a lot more testosterone to make them feel good. It was a very interesting study and they, and it was, it, it was very complicated. It took me a long time to dissect everything that they were doing, but that was the bottom line. And if you take this, this study 
and you liken it to other things, that explains a lot of the reason why I can't give a person, look at them and say, here, this dose is going to certainly be enough for you for six months, for men, six months, and this dose is going to make you feel completely better. Because I don't have one piece of information. I don't have how sticky their receptor sites are. So that's the difference, and that's the part where I have to use my my experience, my practice of medicine. And I have to look at somebody and say, well, you exercise every day, so you're going to need more testosterone in your blood because you're going to use it up faster. Okay, you're going to need bigger pellets small and higher dose. And say you're six foot five and not the average height of five nine, you're going to need more testosterone because you have a bigger body to spread it out all over. And that is, those two things are true. But the one thing I can't figure out and don't know until they come back for their second visit and tell me how they felt and if all their symptoms went away is that receptor site factor. I don't know that. I can't find it. There's no test for it. So I have to use trial and error. Something we've used in medicine forever, but it's an educated trial and error. I am very educated in the in the treatment with testosterone for both men and women. And, and my uh, experience tells me what I should do in certain circumstances to adjust this. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you, if you still aren't getting this, view testosterone like a key. And every cell has a lock on it that is perfect for that key. But sometimes... The key is hard to get in the lock, and therefore it is more resistant. Sometimes the key is really easy and turns that cell on, and everything goes as planned. So when I'm talking to a patient, I have to say there's no commercially available test to test your receptor site uh, activity. And now we're not doing DNA testing for all of this yet. I'm sure that'll come soon. So I am going to make the best estimate of the dose that you need. We are going to check back with you a month early, not six months, but five months, and see if you had enough testosterone. I'm more concerned about not having enough than having a little bit too much, because I usually err on the side of being conservative. And if that person did not feel the testosterone at a higher dose than I would, or higher blood level than I would expect, then I know that they're resistant. They need to have a higher dose to just make their receptor sites respond. So when people ask me, oh, what blood level do I need? What am I shooting for? Well, the answer from how I was trained was anywhere between a free testosterone, free means active, the active portion of testosterone is the only thing you need to know because the active portion is the only thing you feel. You don't feel all the testosterone that you have stored that is bound up to a protein. Your body doesn't perceive it's even there. But the testosterone that is active and can actually attach to a rep receptor site, that's the number I was trained to look at. And when that receptor, excuse me, when that blood level is between 129 uh, picograms per milliliter and 350 picograms per milliliter. That is the range of what I'm, I'm looking for. Now, that's a huge range, granted. But that it's when somebody gets into that range and then their symptoms go away. They don't have ED anymore. They're not depressed. They... Um, for women, they get their sex drive back. For men, they get their erections back and their sex drive back. For um, some people can't sleep without testosterone. Some people are anxious without testosterone. Some people even have hot flashes without testosterone. And all, when all these symptoms are gone and they get their muscle strength back and they feel like themselves, that's the number that I'd like to get that person to all the time. 
So I develop a normal or a optimal level for that person, but it may not be the optimal level for the next person I see. So it is all very much dependent on your physician or nurse practitioner as to how to adjust your hormones. So we use both methods. We use them, we use lab, we use symptoms. We talk to our patients, we see if their symptoms have resolved. If they've resolved, that tells me that's enough testosterone and their receptor sites are filling. Now, one other thing we have to think about, especially for men, is how much estrogen is running around. Because interestingly enough, if you have a lot of estrogen, it competes with testosterone for the same receptor site. So it's two keys that fit the same lock. And if an estrogen turns that lock on, it does completely different things than if the testosterone does. So it's an opposite kind of reaction. So it fills the receptor, but it doesn't let the, the cell act like testosterone is there. So we try to decrease the estrogen blood level in most men below 30. Now, the lab sheet says less than 68 is okay, but that's not healthy, and that does cause a lot of com competition with the testosterone. So we don't use that normal. We use the normal I was trained with, which is 30 and below is okay for most men to have an estrone below 30 and an estradiol below 29. Those two numbers are important. So I do look at those blood levels, and if somebody has a lot of estrogen, I have to decrease that so that there, the competition with the receptor site isn't so much that they can't feel the testosterone I'm giving them. It also does something else. It binds up more of the free testosterone. So, the, so when you have estrogen on board, if you're a male, lots more testosterone is going to be inactivated, and you won't feel it. And you're also going to have competition for the receptor site. So it's, it is my job to decrease that estrogen, not to nothing, because you need some estrogen. Every man needs some for their brain and bones. But to get it down to a low level so that that is not interfering with the testosterone treatment that they're receiving. So that's another kind of interesting twist to the kind of rules that I was, show, I was telling you. So basically, what I'm saying is, oh, it's not that easy to do this, and they, people have to be trained, and they have to listen to their patients, hear them, just like any other, uh, hor any other hormone treatment, your symptoms should go away. If, if your symptoms go away, usually that means you have enough of that hormone for you. It may not be enough for your neighbor. You can't compare people because our genes are all so different. So what we have to do is we have to compare, we have to find your blood level and we have to try to reach it all the time when we're trying to replace your hormones. And that is very important. But talking to you about your symptoms is key. If you don't tell us that you aren't feeling better, that you're not sleeping, that your sex drive isn't back, then I'm not gonna be able to know what to do with your testosterone, especially if your levels look great. So. This is why the blood test doesn't tell me everything. It just tells me one side of the story. And the other side of the story, I don't have a test for, so I must substitute my, um, <laughs> my questioning of symptoms, my questioning of, of a patient's lifestyle, and I have to add that into my formula to decide how to treat that particular patient. And sometimes we write on a patient's chart, you know, resistant to testosterone or insulin, like insulin resistance, testosterone resistance. You need a whole lot just to feel normal. And on the other side, we don't necessarily have to say, oh, this patient doesn't need much. We know that. We can figure that out. And we just keep the dose at the same level, and they feel great. So I don't, I'm speaking to all of you. I'm sure that there is every genetic type in, in my audience. But I think it's important that you know that this is not something like one plus one is two. It isn't. It is something much more complicated than that. And it is something that maybe someday we'll have an answer to, but we don't right now. So since you need treatment right now, we'll take care of that. 
at least in our office and hopefully in the other offices that do the same kind of treatment, will be asking you if your symptoms are better. And if they're not, you should be telling them. So thank you for listening to me today. I hope this helps you with your testosterone treatment and, um, and gives you an idea of what we're thinking about when we are talking to you about your symptoms. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.